You've got to respect the story first, and you have to respect the actors, and you have to respect uh, uh, whatever it is that the director needs uh, to get that story onto film. The Batman is set to release in just over a week's time, and from what we've seen so far, it has some of the most striking cinematography of any superhero film to date. But today, I want to look at arguably the best Batman film of all time, and what Wally Pfister did to make it one of the most cinematically impressive superhero films ever made. In today's video, I'll be looking at what equipment Pfister used, how he achieved the striking lighting we see throughout, as well as his use of movement and composition, as it's much more complicated than you would have originally thought. To state the obvious, a lot of this film was shot in IMAX, 28 minutes of it to be exact, and just so I don't waste time talking about it, I'll just link my recent video that fully explains what IMAX is. Anyway, Fister ended up using 5 cameras on The Dark Knight, including a Beaumont's VistaVision, IMAX Mark III, IMAX MSM 9802, Panavision Panaflex Millennium XL and a Panaflex Platinum. The IMAX cameras are obviously the gold standard for Nolan, and in fact, this was the first major film to properly use them. But what's more interesting is the Beaumont VistaVision, as VistaVision is the only format other than IMAX to process film horizontally, rather than vertically. But that makes sense as it was sort of a testing ground for IMAX. VistaVision is often used for special effects sequences as it allows for a higher resolution than regular 35mm. As for the XL and Platinum, these are simply good cameras. They're reliable and won't cost as much to replace when Nolan eventually breaks them. Onto the lenses however, Fisted opted for Panavision Primos, Hasselblads for the IMAX cameras, however I can't find the specific ones, Panavision C and E series lenses, as well as their super high speed lenses. Now, Primos are some great all-round lenses with high contrast and resolution, with minimal railing glare and distortion. The C and E series are again clean lenses with an organic feel and are just perfect for pretty much any project. But now I think it's time to talk about the lighting. Very poor choice of words. <laughs> What got me through was the approach that I had taken on Chris's other films, which was to keep it very much grounded in reality and keep the lighting very natural. My approach was to go into real kind of urban environments and look at the textures and lights in places like Chicago and London and try and get inspiration for what would be the look of the film. There's something about Fister's lighting style that can really cause some confusion and it's the fact that it's unbelievably natural. So much so that I have seen conversations surrounding his talent as a DP, which is absolutely insane. His style is centred around realism, and whilst that may be a bit darker than what we are used to, especially in the Dark Knights trilogy, it's what those places would look like in real life. Now for those of you that have also seen my video on Tenet, you'll note that Hoytemer also uses a similar lighting style, in the way that they are lighting the location and keeping it natural which points towards Nolan being the cause of all of this. So what kind of lighting did Fister use? Well, throughout, he uses low-key lighting quite prominently, as even though a lot of the film is set at night and it quite literally has dark in the name, it also just fits the story, as it is a dark story. One of my favourite examples of low-key lighting is the good cop, bad cop scene, mainly due to the juxtaposition of darkness and light, whether it's between Gordon leaving or just the other room. Now, we could look into the potential meaning of this lighting, for example, the Joker is a dark character, therefore he is surrounded by darkness, but if Fister didn't say it, and I haven't found any interview stating so, I don't feel comfortable giving potential meaning. However, we can look at other uses of lighting, such as the constant use of rim lighting. Now, this is usually used to separate the actor from the background, and it creates this really nice depth without having to do too much. But it also allows us to focus on a specific character if there are others in the shot, as this leads our eyes to where they want us to look. Back onto the low key slash high key lighting, there are a lot of bright scenes, clearly the daytime but also the bat cave. Now this is a very distinct bat cave, especially if we look at all of the others throughout film history, namely because it's not really a cave, but for my purpose of showing a lot of bright lighting throughout, it's perfect. Where does all this brightness come from though, as in a lot of the previous Batman films it's been dark all the way until the end, 
I mean, that's a given for Burton, but still. As it turns out, Nolan really hates shooting at night, so as the series goes on, we get more and more daylight. I mean, the main fight for The Dark Knight Rises is in the middle of the day. In an interview with Fister, he explains, what about if I create an environment that's almost overexposed, really, really bright? Chris loved that idea of Batman switching on a light, and then he starts to kick ass. I think that was the first time we really explored a brighter environment for Batman. To touch on the silhouette aspect though, it's really, really prominent, yet not at the same time. When we see it, we know exactly what we are looking at and how it should make us feel, so it's prominent in that way yet used very much in restraint, as it's savoured for the more important scenes. It also just fits so unbelievably well into the film. When you are shooting in both IMAX and anamorphic, you have to be cautious about how you're going to cut scenes together, which is one of the reasons as to why centre framing is so prominent in this film. But it can also be used for storytelling purposes, as it seems to here. For example, with the opening shot, we could interpret this as a way to show immersion in a new environment, to create impact, or simply to show power in a character. There's a lot of wide framing throughout this film, and whilst a lot of it will be down to the IMAX photography, it also creates a really immersive environment. On the other end of the spectrum, we only really get close to characters when it's an intimate scene. Sure, dialogue scenes are in a medium close-up, but the face only ever fills the frame in important moments. So in researching for this video, I was looking through articles and found someone talking about splitting the frame 50-50, which I really thought nothing of until I looked through this page of stills and found out that a good amount of the film uses this technique. I mean, we have Batman on a rooftop, Dent in a hospital bed, Gordon in the vault, even Alfred at a desk. Now, this isn't used in every shot, not even most shots, but I still found it a really interesting theory and wanted to include it in this video. It's just something to think about. To touch on leading lines, it's constant, and as a casual viewer, we never really notice it until it's pointed out to us. Now, there are shots where it's really obvious, for example, in the Batcave, but then there are also shots like this, where Joker is sitting in an interrogation room. Our eyes are still guided towards him, and yes he is the prominent character in the scene, but also the walls point at him. I think regarding composition as a whole, it all revolved around the best way to utilise IMAX. I mean, the amount of centre frame alone solidifies this idea. Just because I have to though, there are a lot of low angles in this film, and it's because it's a superhero film and they're used to convey power. However, to look at movement, it's really natural and free-flowing, yet in a discreet way. It's hardly noticeable, which I guess is the end goal in cinematography. But what did Fister do differently in this to other films? Well, the amount of handheld alone is not something to shy away from, as even though it's incredibly subtle, it brings us into the world even more than you could ever imagine and I don't even need to look into the theory here, as that is what it is often used for, to connect with an audience. But I can't not talk about the constant back and forth on a dolly in conversation. For some reason, this engages us so much. It isn't distracting, and if anything, it helps tell the story even more than just leaving it static. Creating movements between the characters can be interpreted as many things, notably good and bad, but also acceptance, as it is here, between Dent and Wayne. It also helps that Fister dollies in a little bit. Overall though, I think Nolan just really likes handheld above anything else, and by the looks of it, Fister got out at the right time if he wanted to save his back. Overall, The Dark Knight is a landmark in blockbuster filmmaking, as not only did it use IMAX in a feature narrative film for the first time, but it set a new extremely high standard for superhero films. Wally Fister managed to create possibly the most nonchalant atmosphere I've ever seen in an action film, and it's going to be remembered for decades to come. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, you know what to do if you did. If you have a recommendation for an analysis, leave it down below. Thank you so much for watching, and maybe I'll see you next time. Bye.